painting the peach posies red. 8 a.m. I sat that morning at the windowsill of a little peach colored house. The smell of pink posies on my tongue, warm sunlight in my nose. It's a quaint and quiet house with a peaceful little front yard and a pair of twin windows peeking out at the world from the second floor. The lawn is trimmed and green in the glow of the rising sun. A pair of birds chirps joyfully from the white picket fence. Dogs bark sleepily on either side of this little peach house with pink posies and a white picket fence. It's a peaceful little front yard, complete with a bird bath and a proud American flag. At the end of the driveway stands the Ever On Guard mailbox, painted in peach and green with the word Clark, scrawled along the side in blue marker. The neighbors begin to stir, passing groggily into their vehicles on the way to work. Some of them look in my direction. They're admiring the posies, but their gaze passes right through me. They never see me. They can't see me. Until the right time, that is. If they're lucky, they'll never get to meet me. But time is a cruel lover, and he has a sharp tendency to favor me over them quite often before the end. Forgive me, I've gone off on a tangent. The mother of the household is a rather plump, plump woman. Tis the proper shape for a cook, she'd say. She prims and polishes the furniture more than she does herself. Flyaways protrude gangly from her hair's top knot. White powder flakes off her cream-colored skin, and her lipstick could use a touch-up. But she's been cleaning since five in the morning, and she still needs to feed her husband and children, who will be up shortly to devour the breakfast she's labored over. For now, she stands graciously reading a book while leaning against the island counter, awaiting the hustle and bustle of breakfast time in the Clark household. The book's cover is worn, one of Mother's favorites, no doubt. The binding is a soft orangey pink with golden scrawl across the spine, reading Jane Eyre. Such an interesting piece of literature. Mother turns page after page, her fingers daintily caressing the passages as though the book were a precious babe. The minutes pass, and at 8.15, after she scrolled through about 10 pages, the first of her family treads downstairs. The daughter is tall and athletic, a tennis player through and through. She is an adored picture of youth, rosy-cheeked and skin kissed by sunshine. Wearing a perfectly pressed school uniform and just the right amount of makeup, the daughter grabs a piece of toast off the kitchen counter and rushes out the front door to the beckoning of a car horn, despite the calls of her mother. The teen fluffs the tail end of her golden ponytail before disappearing through the portal, chiming half-hearted farewells to no one in particular and blowing a kiss to the street. The son, all knobby knees and lanky pubescent limbs, barrels down the stairs in a symphony of stomps and curses and pointedly ignores the swats and scolds of his mother in favor of shoveling as much of the long labored over breakfast down his gullet. Eggs, sausage, bacon, toast, it all disappears within seconds. Mother stands to the side, book clutched to her chest, proud and horrified all at once that he might choke to death with one false swallow. She has nothing to fear. Death doesn't sit on her threshold this morning. The teenager, satisfied in his gorging, delivers a curt peck to his mother's cheek and disappears out the same door that claimed his sister, skateboard under arm, nearly forgetting his favorite baseball cap in the process. He smashes it onto his head as the door clicks shut. The father is an interesting character a science teacher, though he calls himself a scientist. He appears to be the only one moving at a normal rate this morning, ambling down the stairs while fixing his tie and riding his overcoat. overcoat. Clean shaven, tall and thin, you can see from whom son inherited his gangly limbs, the man sits down at the table and unfolds the day's newspaper, which has been patiently awaiting his arrival without question. His wife sets in front of him a cup of steaming hot coffee and a full plate of breakfast. 
the coffee receives his attention first. The woman sits opposite him with a cup of tea in hand, nearly sighing in relief as the blood returns to her overworked feet. The sound is suppressed, however, as she chooses instead to quietly sip and ponder her day. It's a Thursday, according to the calendar, and there is much to be done. The Dawson's girl is still missing, husband announces suddenly. His wife hums into the rim of her teacup. I can't imagine what those poor people are going through, she says. I hope to God they find her there soon. Her husband hums around a mouthful of black coffee. They speak no further. He reads and eats and drinks while she sit, sits and sips and nibbles on the piece of bacon and toast she's allowed onto her plate. It isn't until he's bestowed a sweet kiss goodbye to pink posy-colored lips on the steeple between their doorstep that he speaks again. Have a good day, dear. You too, sweetheart. So picturesque and delightful, the neighborhood housewives sigh and resign to chiding their own husbands when they see them next. Then a husband settles himself into the driver's seat of the family Volkswagen, backs out of the driveway and heads to work. She blows him one last kiss for good measure before heading back inside to start cleaning, mentally going through her checklist for the day. She has groceries to buy, dinner to start, and laundry to take care of. And oh, she can't forget to make that meat pie for the new neighbors. Her husband brought home specialty meat just for the occasion. She hums while she cleans up the kitchen, and when she finishes, she tucks her grocery list away in her purse, applies a dash of lipstick, and allows the front door to click gently shut behind her, the bolt sliding locked at the mercy of her keys. With the house empty, nothing but photographs of family vacations and family portraits to keep it company, I flutter in to take a closer look. <laughs> There's one picture in particular that catches my eye. It's sitting over the fireplace, the most recent of church-sponsored portraits. Black and white, it's probably only a month old. Daughter, dressed in the cap and gown she'll be wearing for real in just two weeks, smiles brightly from the center of the frame. Little brother has bubbled his way under her arm to give the camera an open mouth grin. Mother stands behind the pair, her face barely peeking out over her daughter's shoulder, either hand holding tightly to her children. Father stands on daughter's other side, an arm around her waist. The two are quite nearly the same height as she comes to just under his cheekbone. His smile isn't in his lips, it reflects out the shimmer of gray eyes. 9.03 a.m. Oh, I do hate coming down to the high school. It's noisy and it pains my eyes. Daughter chats with her classmates down the senior corridor. She tells a story about the previous weekend for what must have been the third time that week. How she snuck out of the house to meet her so-called boyfriend, a real bad boy by the sound of it, in secret for the most romantic night of her life. I think she's telling the story again because they don't believe her. She is graduating valedictorian of a Catholic high school, and girls with good grades don't have time or the nerve to go on scandalous secret dates with leather-jacketed boyfriends. She won't fight them too hard on it. After all, they're her best girlfriends, and they're probably just teasing her for it. Not that it matters whether they believe her or not. She knows the truth. She knows how smart and dreamy he was, how patient and kind, how he took care of her through this huge step into adulthood, how afterwards they talked about everything and nothing, what they wanted to do after graduation, what their dreams for the future were. She wants to go to Paris, run away from this suffocating little town and fall in love with love and fashion. How amazing would it be to become a model or an actress? forget about school and her parents' expectations, and live for love and romance and adventure. She remembers saying how amazing it would be if he could come with her. He didn't respond verbally, but the way he looked at her, his green eyes shining with adoration, she can't help but hope that maybe, just maybe, he'll say yes. She smiles to herself. 
it would be a dream come true. She lifts her eyes and sees him standing with his friends across the hall. His lips quirk in a half smile and he runs a hand through his dark hair. Definitely a dream come true. Natalie! Her daydreams come to a rattling halt, however, as little brother comes screeching down the hallway, skateboard in hand and fresh bruises already turning pink under his jaw. The newly split lip is easy to notice too, considering the bright red still clinging to the edge of his puffy lower lip. Well, freshmen in the senior corridor, watch your fingers, ladies, I hear they bite. Someone shouts. Little brother just growls at the jerk before swatting away a paper ball. What are you doing here? Asks big sister as he comes to a halt in front of her. Jeez, her friends are already giggling behind her back. Nat, please, can you ask one of your friends to give me a ride home during lunch? I forgot my homework and I... Not a chance, Steph. Ask one of your friends to give you a ride. You're not even supposed to be in this hallway. Uh, but no, Josh. She crosses her arms across her chest and gives him a stern look. Tough love, her mother would call it. As much as she loves her little brother, he has to learn to be for his own mistakes. Your lack of responsibility isn't my fault, and I won't have my friends go out of their way because you forgot your homework. An arm wraps around her waist, and she tenses for a moment before realizing exactly who could come up behind her. Aw, oh, come on, Nat. Don't be so hard on the brat, says boyfriend into her ear. Eric, you scared me. Sorry, baby, he whispers, planting a kiss just under her ear. Her girlfriends swoon and fan them at the gesture. Natalie's cheek turned a lovely arabescent at the spectacle before Eric at the spectacle before Eric continues speaking over the gushing girls. I'll give Josh a ride home during lunch. So quickly, her blonde pigtails whips through the air. You shouldn't do that. It'd be too much trouble. Nonsense. It'll be fine. You're my girl, and he's your little brother. That my little bro, too. What kind of a guy would I be if I didn't help my little brother out? Eric winks a sea green eye at Josh. Natalie is too busy playing with boyfriend's shirt collar to notice her brother flinch at the gesture. Well, I guess that just makes you a hero, doesn't it? It's nothing, babe. Call it my good deed for the day. He turns to little brother. Meet me in the back lot at noon. Josh opens his mouth to reject the offer, but his sister cuts him off with a scathing glare. If you are even a minute late meeting Eric, I will hang your baby pictures up all over the school. The bell rings and she floats away with Eric's arm held, firmly held hostage in her hand. 10.32 a.m. Father collects the papers he's been creating for the last couple of hours into a pile before tucking them away into his briefcase to take with him into the lecture. It is as he's slipping on, sipping on his lab coat that the knock sounds at his office door. Hey Clark, you got a second? Dawson. You're at work today? Dawson, from the morning paper. The man whose daughter went missing? The school's coach looks haggard and gray, aged at least 10 years since the last time Mr. Clark spoke to him. That was about a week ago, if I remember correctly, before the man's daughter mysteriously disappeared. I had to get out of the house. Wendy, she's, she's not taking it well. Is there ever a good way to take it when our children are involved? A valid point, one Dawson knows all too well. The man looks ready to pass out on his feet from exhaustion. Clark watches as his colleague's eyes glaze over as though journeying to a far off place before Dawson lifts his eyes from the floor, mouth agape to say something, when something shudders to the floor behind the door leading to Mr. Clark's personal laboratory. What was that? Father sighs, shaking his head slowly. One of the lab rats got loose yesterday. Haven't been able to catch it yet. Dawson stares at the door a moment. Clark doesn't like the look on his face. What did you need? The man snaps to attention. Uh, sorry, lost myself for a second there. 
He shakes his head, pulling a piece of paper out of the folder he's carrying. He hands the note to Father, carefully, shaking along the way, hands shaking along the way. Uh, Wendy and I are hosting a church service tomorrow to pray for our daughter's safety. We and your family to be there. Clark smiles sadly at the man. Of course, Dawson. Any way we can show our support. Thank you, the man breathes before exiting the office, drifting like a ghost on the wind. Our professor watches as the door closes. He places the paper in the tray on his desk, designated to hold day, week, month old paperwork, and gathering his materials, heads off to his 1045 lecture. 8.41 a.m. Little brother rolls his skateboard into the school grounds with a flick of his toes, and with a flick of his toes, the board flips into his hand. It's a punky affair. His mother hates it. She thinks it's a dangerous, oversized toy, but he doesn't pay her any mind. His sister makes fun of him because the wheels on it are neon pink. He doesn't care. It's his favorite color. Trudging through the glass front doors, the freshman is mindful enough to straighten out his academy-issued tie as he sulks past the principal's office. He almost makes it to his locker before the first fist connects with the side of his face. The blow sends him whirling into the locker to smash his jaw and lip against the cold metal. Ah, he grunts, reaching around in hopes of hitting the ass who punched him. But his assailant only hits once more before spitting a little at little brother's shoes and disappearing down the hall. None of the other students even pause to look at the spectacle. The teenager clutches at his lip and tries to keep the blood from staining his shirt. Tears blur, doe brown eyes now tinted in a line of pink. He looks up at the ceiling, swallowing down the tears lodged in his throat before turning his head in the direction of the far end of the corridor where he watches sister's boyfriend watching him. 10.51 a.m. Mother gets home and immediately sets to work on that meat pie. She starts by putting the meat out of the ice box, a large two pound slab, wonderfully marbled and salmon colored. She unwraps the package like she would an anniversary gift folded in fine silk. She doesn't have a clue from which butcher her husband acquired this beautiful steak, but she makes a mental note to ask him when he gets home because the meat slices as easily as butter and the edges are trimmed in the exact amount of fat she'll need to marinate it without having an excess left over and without having to worry about drying out the meat. She powders her hands with flour, the flesh already rising to her cheeks from the stove heat. The school bell rings as the wadded up piece of paper hits brother in the face much to the laughter of his so-called peers. He rolls his eyes. His hands do not shake as he unravels the crumpled up strip, strip of paper. They only stutter once as the message comes into view as he exits the classroom, and he punches the wall because he isn't allowed to get into, into any more fights. It's only one word anyway. Scribbled across the paper in all capital chicken scratch. One word, faggot. 11.47 a.m. The bell rang two minutes ago, so they patiently wait for little brother to arrive. Sister Dearest is leaning heavily against the car, a dusty blue Volvo, sleek and cool, while his boyfriend's hands run down the sides of her waist and hips. He eagerly explores her lips as this fresh spring her long sunshine hair. Baby, stop it. Josh will be here any second. So, he sings songs back to her. Let him watch and learn. Eric, she giggles as he nuzzles his nose into his, her jawline. Brother Joss clears his throat from about five feet away. His sister frowns prettily, shoving Eric away with a scolding look. The tall male just grins, green eyes glimmering. Sister Natalie collects herself, smoothing a wrinkle out of her pleated skirt and walks past her brother, ruffling his hair playfully along the way, back inside to meet up with her girlfriends for lunch. Hey, 
says Josh, offering the first word. Hey. Eric's reply is laced with a smirk, but it holds no opening for continued conversation. He simply says, let's go, and climbs into the driver's seat, expecting Josh to follow through on the command. The younger boy does, but the hesitation in his step is hard to miss. 12.05 p.m. <clears throat> Mother inhales deep and long, gently tucking away the freshly finished pie into a neatly arranged picnic basket between soft cotton tallets of pink and orange. She nudges a few jars of homemade jam in beside her masterpiece for added measure before plucking, plucking her keys off the counter. She pauses for a quick second at the same mirror her daughter checked her hair in while earlier that morning. There's a spot of flour powdering her cheek. She uses one of the peachy hand towels to rub it off before replacing the cloth in the basket and continuing out the door. She employs the garden shears to cut a handful of posies from the flower bed to add to her basket, her bundle. Her dainty fist. lips and auburn hair displayed in wavy disarray. The infant screams in her arms and the mother notices that the young mother's mascara is smudged and possibly even a day old. Hello? Hello, dear, said mother, a welcoming smile adorning freshly painted lips. I'm sorry to bother you, but I'm one of your new neighbors from three houses down. I beg you a welcome to the neighborhood pie. The young woman looks abashed and fl flustered at the gesture. So thank you, that, that's so sweet of you. She trails off, waiting for a name. Mrs. Clark, Mother answers the unspoken question. And your name, dear? Kathleen, Kathleen Brighton. It's a pleasure to make your acquaintance. Mother smiles brightly as she hands over the basket, watching as the girl attempts to jungle the screaming, wiggling infant simultaneously. It makes her almost sad. This new neighbor can't be more than two or three years older than her own daughter. Is it a boy or girl? She asks before the young mother can close the door. A boy, the redhead answers, surprised at the woman's interest. You first? She nods with a hum of affirmation. Is it that obvious? Mother laughs. Not at all, dearie. Only to a seasoned veteran. Do you mind if I... She holds her arms out in an offering, letting the gesture finish her inquiry. Though she appears reluctant, the younger female allows her to hold. Mother coos at the babe several moments before, as though by a miracle, the little one quiets. The redhead's watery blue eyes seem to widen. Both women take a moment to admire the baby as he dutifully drifts off into sleep. The tired face of the younger woman softens into a smile. I'm sorry, she says. I've been rude. Would you like to come inside and have a cup of tea or coffee and maybe some pie? I would like that. 12.47 p.m. It's somewhat drafty up in the school's cafeteria rafters. Daughter is sitting at the table directly beneath me, and she keeps scraping her knife across already shredded pieces of food until each piece is roughly the size of her pinky nail before attempting to put anything in her mouth to swallow. Her girlfriends are terribly preoccupied chatting about potential boyfriends. She has to care to mention Eric with, when appropriate, and their last shopping haul. Too busy to speculate at the peculiarity in her eating habit, so anyone it might appear as though she's eaten quite a bit of her meal. If questioned, she'll say she's eaten far too much, and no one will give her plate a second glance. The girls coo and sigh, jabbering on about romance and dreamy Prince Charmings, one of them ought to have half-handedly laughing that Natalie already found her prince lucky girl that she was to have someone like him. She wholeheartedly agrees with a blush before taking one last bite of food. She laughs and plays and smiles for several seconds before excusing herself to the ladies' room, taking her tray with her to dump it in a nearby bin. One bite too much? 
She reaches the girl's bathroom easily enough, closing the stall door behind her. She clenches her stomach with one hand, the other runs through her hair in shaky strokes. It's hot and stuffy, damp heat getting hotter by the second as the sweat builds over her brow. She lurches forward onto her knees and shoves the lid of the toilet open. A finger worm it, worms its way to the back of her throat to hit the backs of her tonsils, and she heaves into the bowl. She finishes up, flushing after a few, flushed after a few dry heaves. The mirror lets her know that her waist, still not thin enough, hasn't gotten any thicker. Her hair is fine, but she needs to reapply her makeup. She's too pale, in her opinion. So she applies bronzer and some peachy powder to her cheekbones before smiling at her reflection with pink tinted lips. Much better. The school bell rings, so she packs up her things and goes to her next class, biology with her father. 12.30 PM. Brother and boyfriend make it back to the lot just as the bell rings to signal the start of the last block. Brother flexes his hand against the dashboard clenching and unclenching his fingers. His whole body is still vibrating. Eric retrieves a pack of cigs out of the center console, half sincerely offering one to the younger boy, and pulls one for herself when Josh refuses. He holds the stick between his teeth to light it up before taking a long drag. You'd better scram, kid, he speaks, smoke punctuating each word. You already missed last class. You don't want to be late for last block. Joshua doesn't respond, not verbally at least. He simply opens the car door, slides his feet onto the pavement, and retreats. Eric's eyes burn into his back as he makes his way into the school, where the safety and anonymity of a sea of swarming, crowding students blankets him from the green gaze, mindful of how he maneuvers his weight on his legs. 12.07 <clears throat> p.m. Mother gets home from visiting the neighbor much later than she originally intended, but that meat pie was just so tasty, and the young woman, Kathleen, she reminds herself, proved to be such a delight. Her husband is a lawyer and quite a few years older than her. She's staying at home to take care of the baby until there's enough money for her to go to college. She said her husband would pay for everything. Isn't that something? So sweet. Mother never went to college herself. And that baby, so precious. She remembers when her children were that small. It makes her heart ache just a little with want for another baby to care for. She completely lost track of time. She should have come home right after dropping off the basket. Now she's afraid dinner won't be ready by the time her family gets home. She doesn't even know what she's making yet. Lasagna, pot roast, or perhaps stuffed bell peppers. Oh yes, why not another meat pie? She has enough of that steak left to make another. Imagine her surprise, however, when her son nearly runs her down on his way out the door. All she hears is the banging of drawers, stomping of feet in his room as she carefully climbs the stairs and he reappears in a flurry of movement. Josh, what are you doing home? Sorry, Mom, I forgot my homework. He calls, running across the yard to dive into, is that Eric's car? Josh, she stops again too late. The vehicle is already rolling down the road. But on earth, hands on her hips, mother huffs her way up the stairs to her son's room. It's messy, of course. What else could you expect from a teenage boy, really? She sighs through her nose at the general disarray of the room and thus begins picking up clothing, <coughs> examining each article for clean, dirty evaluation before tossing the garments into her son's laundry hamper. When she finally reaches the herself to reorganize scrambled bedclothes, wrestling a shirt and a pair of underpants from the sheets. She tosses the blouse into the hamper of the boxers, scheduled to follow the same path, but she pauses mid-throw, noticing dampness to the dark fabric. She turns the soiled item over in her hands. There, in the seat of the crotch, blooms a darkened wet spot against the navy blue material. Her fingertips come away smeared in red. 4.19 p.m. Father snaps the elastic of his goggles against the back of his hand, head. Gloved fingers twitch as he hovers over the sleeping form of his newest lab specimen. He decided that it's time. 
The creature has done its job, and after the racket it made this morning, it's time to put it to permanent rest. High time, thinks Mr. Clark. He takes the scalpel in one hand, bone saw in the other, and cuts a straight horizontal line through the flesh under the specimen's right clavicle. The bone saw is used to cut through the rib and sternum until the heart is exposed. Of other animals. The fingers of his right hand twitch. He reaches for the needle sitting in his right, filled with a moist mixture of potassium and arsenic, a poignant combination that could put down an elephant in seconds. He hooks his thumb into the plunger, slides the needle into the fleshy, pulsing muscle, and pushes. 12.37 p.m. It's boyfriend's idea to grab a bite to eat first. They end up at this drive-in joint. Eric even volunteers to pay for little brother's food. The waitress, with two curly, cotton candy pink hair, rolls up to the window, popping gum and smacking cherry red lips. Splurts shamelessly with boyfriend. How sweet of a guy he must be to take his little brother out to lunch like this. Josh opens his mouth to protest, but Eric catches him in a chokehold before the words can even dribble out of his mouth. The waitress giggles. 2.25 p.m. Stay behind a moment, please, calls father. Yes, daddy, she asks. Have you seen your brother today? Daughter pal prettily, a little disappointed the conversation doesn't really pertain to her. Not since the start of lunch break, why? The man collects his notes from the day's lecture, though really he might well just keep track of how many flies flew in and out of his snoozing students' ears for all that they paid any attention to his efforts to educate them in the wonders of the human muscular system. Oh, the nurse just mentioned he'd been by earlier this morning. <coughs> Is he getting into fights? His daughter shakes her head. I thought he'd just fallen off his skateboard again. Father hums into his fist, telling her to find him before heading home, once she got out of the tennis practice before letting her go. Natalie turns over her shoulder and heads to her last class of the day, which so happens to be the only class she has with her precious boyfriend. Thank goodness for that, because she was close to its end. Screw this obnoxious school system. Imagine her annoyance when she walks into the class to find Eric missing. Their history professor drones on and on about the American boyfriend is nowhere to be found. It isn't until the old dinosaur is babbling about sexual relationships between soldiers. I'll let you in on a little secret. I once had my sights set on this professor, but alas, it wasn't meant to be. That boyfriend decides to stroll into the classroom, hands in pockets and tie undone around his neck. Precisely 17 minutes tardy. Where have you been? She hisses while professor declares something along the lines of manly bonding in a time of war. I need to smoke. You don't smoke. He runs a hand through grease-licked brown hair. His lips twist into a crooked, undeniably boyish stretch across his face. From time to time. 1.08 p.m. This isn't my house. Little brother's muscles are wound so tightly that he can feel his bones grinding against each other. Boyfriend hums around a cigarette, powering down the ignition and opening the car door. You're right. It's mine. He steps out of the car, heading up to the walk on his front door, not even glancing back to the boy sitting in his car. Joshua sighs, finally getting out. It's going to be one of those encounters then. Our son barely makes it past the threshold before he finds himself colliding with the hard wooden door frame, Eric's hands already finding purchase on a sharp hip bone in the angular ridge of his neck teeth crashing against teeth. Josh winces at the still open cut on his lip, gushes once more with a renewed burst of crimson. 
The other boy's tongue happily laps at the cut while simultaneously dragging the smaller boy up the stairs. 3.46 p.m. The buzz of the laundry machine pulls mother away from her task of chopping vegetables in the kitchen. She opens the dryer, humming to herself as she pulls her son's formerly dirty laundry from the bin. She pauses to examine the pair of boxers she found earlier. They are pristine, not a speck of dirt or any other stain on them. She clicks her tongue, proud of her appliance's work, shaking her head and scolding herself. She knew she'd been imagining things earlier. Monday afternoon tennis practices are always a laugh. I watch them infrequently, not that I enjoy the sport or anything. I just always tend to find some of the best places to add to my collection here, however temporary their stay may be in my household. Too many girls with too high standards and an inability to compromise. Sister is frustrated. I can tell by the increased velocity of her serve and return swings. Boyfriend didn't kiss her after last class and now she feels as though she's lagging behind in practice. Playing doubles alongside some new girl, she's angry that her usual partner, Jackie Dawson, the coach's daughter, has been missing for nearly two weeks. Sister doesn't know the girl personally, but she was always too sweet to deserve the kind of misfortune that's befallen her. And now Natalie is left pissed and achy. Having to play with a freshman who is seemingly incapable of hitting anything other than air whenever a ball barrels in her direction. Natalie's next serve is flawless, but when the fuzzy green sphere is hit back at them, her partner, incompetent and nervous, misses. Sister's head spins a little as she skids to a stop, but she shakes the dizziness away, their coach calling for a reset. She's practically breathing fire as she walks the ball across the court and unspoken, this is how it's done, rips through the ozone in the direction of her so-called partner. The ball herders back towards her, thankfully. She cocks her right arm back and hisses as she exhales. The ball cracks against the netting of the racket and Natalie's vision goes black. Her <coughs> partner screams as an explosion of pain cracks through the back of her skull. 3.47 p.m. The sun looks up as a wad of paper hits him in the back of his head. Meet me in the back parking lot at 4.30. Signed, E. 4.56 p.m. Father immerses himself in his work, pulling apart joints and ligaments that he doesn't hear the footsteps coming from the hall. He isn't broken from his scientific trance until the door to his lab, which he'd forgotten to lock in his eagerness to experiment, is slammed open. Richard, your daughter, there's been an accident. The school coach, Dawson, the man with the missing daughter, cuts himself off with a strangled yelp at the site he's just entered in on. 5.46 p.m. Mother looks up from knitting the dough, kneading the dough for another meat pie as the phone rings. 4.32 p.m. He's here, as expected. Josh has his skateboard tucked under his arm. Locked empty, and they are staring at each other. Boyfriend sucks on a cancer stick for several pregnant minutes before speaking. This needs to stop. Brother stays quiet, watching the smoke dissipate into an already cloudy gray atmosphere. He can practically see the ozone thinning, waiting to open up and release a tumult of raw elements as if the smoke from the fag is applying pressure to the veil hosts holding the rain at bay. I'm not gay. More smoke and he swears he sees the cloud above then curl in on itself. You're dating my sister. That too, he agrees, shuffling the cigarette out with the bottom of his foot. I laugh, unintentionally and unprofessionally. Thankfully, I don't hear the blunder because the sky decided to rumble at that point in time. Boyfriend kicks the car's tire and turns away from Josh. A hand reaches backwards in the younger boy's direction. Their fingers interlace. 5.13 p.m. Sister's eyes open for just a moment. There's something on her face and her head is pounding something fierce. She wants to throw up. And for a heartbeat, she's sure she would have were it not for her stomach being empty. 
Thank you for small favors, she thinks, as the world fades away once more. The only sensation left is that of her body being lifted, and the sound of a scream pierces her hearing through the dwindling pain. 4.57 p.m. Father freezes mid-slice, eyes wide. Startled at Dawson's surprise entrance, he drops the body part he's been working with onto the table. Forearm, wrist, hand, and five painted fingertips. Sweat beads upon his brow. The limb is still decorated in the silver charm bracelet her father gave her last Christmas. A tennis racket, a graduation cap, and kitten. And six gold curly Q letters, J, A, C, K, I, E. The two men meet eyes. Dawson's nostrils fair, flare, his face flushing a dark shade of pink, and he lunges, reaching for the nearest blade, a bloodied hacksaw. Another body slaps to the title, tile. Father grabs his keys and bag and runs. He's already in the car, making his way down the hallway by the time the scream sounds. 5.09 p.m. The car windows are fogged up. The pair of boys inside apparently incapable of separating for longer than a breath of air. Arms and legs tangled up in each other into the too tight space of the driver's seat. The sound of a siren draws brother's attention away from the moment much to the protest of his partner. The bottom of his stomach drops out as he looks through the smear of his hand swiping across the window. An ambulance has just jumped a lot and sits outside the strip of pavement closest to the tennis courts. Josh, come on, it's probably just somebody having an asthma attack. He pulls away from the wandering mouth trying to take his pulse. Two EMTs rush into the court with a gurney. When they reappear, there's a blonde lying lifeless on the stretcher that looks just like a curse breaks the silence of the car. Josh is out of an instant, racing across the lot faster than a star track star track runner. Is his sister being lifted into the ambulance? What happened? Eric. There's blood everywhere on the court, on her shirt, on the medic's latex covered hands, in her hair. Josh's brown eyes are wide in horror. He's afraid he's going to be sick as his sister's eyes flutter open for just a second before rolling backwards and closed. She fell. Move, kid. I'm her brother, he shouts as Josh finally finds his voice. Then meet us at the hospital. She's going to need blood. Then he shoved backwards into Eric's chest, and the ambulance wheels away, leaving behind skid marks in the tar. Eric has to pull him to the car, into the car after. Josh barely registers another voice screaming in the background from the direction of the school proper. Murder, it shouts. Josh frowns and vaguely registers the flashing red and blue lights that pass Eric's car on the way out of the parking lot. The police cruiser parks and two officers run into the building when another police car pulls up. These officers split up, clearing the area and taking the hysterical woman inside to give her a warm blanket and attempt to calm her down. The rain starts to pour at exactly 5.21 p.m. The blood watered away to leave a peach-colored stain on the far side of the tennis court, roughly the size of a tennis racket. 5.37 p.m. The radio is on in the kitchen. Mother has always been fond of smooth 50s jazz. A little spit by Fred Astaire fades into static as the broadcast is interrupted. Alert. A suspect on the disappearance of 17-year-old Jacqueline Dawson has been named and has fled the police. Suspect is at large, and we believe he is meaning to escape out of town. Suspect is a Caucasian male in his mid-40s and was last seen dressed in a... Mother clicks the radio off. My goodness, I do hope they catch him. She opens the ice box and pulls out the remaining pound of the steak, cradling it like a babe as she sets on the corner swaddled in kitchen towels. 5.18 p.m. Boyfriend charges into the ER first, demanding to know where his daughter, his sister, has been taken. A shame that he, a shame that he is firmly rejected in this endeavor. Are you family? The answer is no. But brother steps forward and gives his title, only to find a slew of paperwork shoved under his nose. The receptionist tells him to take a seat with a smile on her coral-colored lips. We'll be with you shortly. Eric curses colorfully under his breath 
pulling the younger male over the cluster of ratted up seats steaming the waiting room. It says Josh is filling out her, their father's insurance information <coughs> that another ambulance unloads another unfortunate soul to the music of shouting and general pandemonium as the man is wheeled into the hospital. <coughs> At first glance, Eric can't really tell what's wrong with the ma man aside from maybe being a little pale. There's no blood that he can see. He's thinking maybe the poor guy had a heart attack, but then he sees it. Hiding in the hospital still light is a silver shaft of a scalpel protruding from the man's left breast. It's wrapped in gauze and one of the ENTs rides the gurney holding pressure to keep the man's bleeding, keep the man from bleeding to death immediately. The man? Is that Coach Dawson? What the fuck? Dawson is wheeled away. Joss turns his head to see what Eric is cursing about. Yet another gurney is being wheeled in. This one has a body bag on it, but it's shaped deflated in some places, but raised in the center like something's piled on top of the body underneath. The gurney rattles over a metal stopper, shaking the bag. Something rolls off what would be the person's torso to dangle over the edge of the tabletop, still in the bag, but obviously disconnected from the body. 5.48 p.m. Hello, calls mother answering the phone. Hello, am I speaking with Natalie Clark's mother? Yes, can I ask who this is? Yes, ma'am. Your daughter has been admitted into the hospital for a serious accident. It seems she passed out and hit her head during tennis practice. Mother clenches her stomach. Is she all right? She's just been brought back from surgery and is asleep but stable. I'm sorry we didn't get a chance to call you sooner, but I need to ask you when the last time it was that Natalie ate a full meal. Excuse me? Natalie's weight is very low for a girl her age and height, and her body is malnourished. When was the last time you saw Natalie? 5.39 p.m. Father speeds down the highway at 75 miles per hour, squinting through the flood of water assaulting his windshield. He can't breathe, so his fingers claw at the tire around his neck, trying to desperately to loosen it, tightening it instead. His hand shakes as he turns on the radio. It crackles before the static clears and the speaker's voice becomes intelligible over the frequency. Police are trailing suspect Owen Clark as we speak. The suspect is believed to be responsible for the disappearance and now confirmed death of Jackie Dawson. Her father, Thomas Dawson, upon attempting to confront Clark, was attacked and is now in critical condition at the local hospital. Clark is at large and dangerous. Approaching sirens drown out the voice on the radio and they make the flames of Clark's rising migraine screech with upheaval. He slams his foot down on the gas and forces the Volkswagen even faster up the hill. It's as he's speeding down that he realizes his mistake. There's a barricade lighting his path. A rain-soaked officer shouts over a megaphone for him to surrender himself. Instead, he jerks the wheel to the left, going off-road in an attempt to escape. Gunshots fire, the police dive out of the way, and the car hydroplanes directly into the oncoming grill <laughs> of a semi. Brown. Brown eyes wide and bloodshot, father can only lift his hands from the steering wheel as the impact proves correct to all of Newton's laws of motion and conservation of energy. I had been sitting on the dashboard when the glass shattered. I just barely avoided the splash of blood and gray matter. I guess death was watching from somewhere after all. Pity she didn't say hello. The wreckage afterwards is a travesty. Wheels displaced, a few small explosions, shattered glass everywhere not to mention the blood. Father's lifeless body still buckled into the front seat, hands grasping at nothing. They found his head in the back seat. 6.31 p.m. Mother hangs up the phone and scrambles to find her purse. It's as she's checking herself over in the mirror that the doorbell rings. I'm sorry, I'm on my way to... She chokes on her sentence as two police officers now take up the small space at her entryway. One of them, the older of the pair and somewhere in his mid-forties, smiles down at her, tipping the edge of his hat to her. 
The other is a lot younger, swinging 20-something, looking good and fit, shifting nervously from side to side, and judging by the coloring of his skin, is about to be sick. I'm sorry to bother you, ma'am, but are you the spouse of one Owen Clark? She pulls on the lapels of her jacket. Yes, I am Mrs. Clark. What is this about? Uh, ma'am, it might be best to have this conversation inside. Mother clenches at the doorframe in an effort not to fall to her knees. The fabric still holds in sh the fabric she still holds in hand groans from the strain of her grip. Uh, of course, come in. Seven thirteen p.m. Come on, Josh. I said she might not wake up today. Little brother doesn't want to leave. Where are mother and father? He hasn't been told anything. Surely they would have both been here by now. A nurse knocks on the door before peeking her head inside. Visitation hours end in approximately 15 minutes. Josh, a hand finds a place at his shoulder. His eyes slide shut, it's warm. Let me take you home. And the bit of warmth on his shoulder disappears. The aforementioned sighs getting up to follow the other, older boy out at the door. Eric? Brother stops at the door and looks back at the hospital bed. Sister is awake, wide-eyed and fearful, surrounded by tubes and wires and medical equipment. A blood bag dangles next to her bed, filled with Josh's life fluids. He still has the bright yellow bandage wrapped around his elbow to feature, though, is the tape strapping in a large tube to the inside of her nostril in the bag of nourishment, as the nurse called it. What happened? No one answers, so she tries again, looking directly at her little brother. Eric? Boyfriend fidgets before walking around Josh in the direction of the bed. Brother turns on his heel to leave as his sister's face lights up. Some of the color returns to her cheeks, and even though her lips are cracked and dry, this, they stretch into a large smile. The door to the hospital room clicks closed as their hands connect. 7.03 p.m. Everything is quaint and quiet in appearance, just the rain coming down and a lazy drizzle. The peach house with the white picket fence and the pink posies on the veranda sits still and silent under the sprinkle until the front door opens to reveal the two officers being let out by a stoic Mrs. Clark. They bid the new window widow good night as the door closes behind them. As they're making their way down the walk, I can't help but pick up on the conversation from my place hidden in the posies. That poor girl. Still can't wrap my mind around it. Still on about that, grunts the old copper, opening up his umbrella. The meat was shredded off the bones of her legs, George. She was still alive when he did that. I just can't. Why would anybody do that? The older man can offer no comfort. He too had seen the girl's body. The sight had reminded him of the way butchers strip the meat off animals before packaging the steaks. 7.47 p.m. Mom, I'm home. <laughs> the door clicks shut behind Josh. I wisp in behind him and take to the peachy flowery chandelier that hangs over the dining room table. It sways beneath my non weight. The house, however, with its shag carpets and paper walls, is still. Quiet in a way that Josh is unaccustomed to. Typically, Mother is still cooking or serving dinner at this time. Father should be watching television in the living room. Sister is usually upstairs gossiping over the phone with her girlfriends. Mom, calls Josh. Dad. Where are they? It isn't like they were at the hospital. Is anyone home? His voice is hushed as though he were speaking to a ghost in an otherwise empty room. Perhaps he is speaking to a ghost.
The fire alarm shrieks to life. There's smoke coming from the kitchen and Josh is only just noticing. The stovetop is on fire. Josh's eyes widen with a yelp before taking off his soaked through jacket and throwing over the flaming pan, flipping the dials of the stove off. He tries to shoo the smoke out the window with his hands to no avail before tossing out the charred remains of the black lumps of what he presumes to have been vegetables. At least there wasn't anything else on the stovetop, just the bubbling of some sort of red sauce which shimmered over the edge of the pot to stain the countertops. Mother? Once again, there's no answer. She had to have just been down here. The cutting board she used, only uses for meat is sitting out and the knife drawer is open. But there's nothing. Just the pat, pat, pat of red liquid spattering against the kitchen floor and the trail of splatter that leads away from the kitchen and up the stairs. The little brother follows the breadcrumbs, not sure what he's going to find at the edge of this forest. The steps whimper and whine as little brother climbs them. He should be used to the noise, after all. He lives in this house. He climbs these steps every day of his life. When he reaches the landing, he notices that, notices that the hatch to the attic is open. Mom? Dad? Just the pattering of rain on the roof. There's water dripping onto the carpet and a growing puddle that seems to have already reached the hardwood stairs, creating the tiniest of waterfalls. Josh ducks into the bathroom to pull a flashlight out from under the sink before climbing into the attic. It's hot, humid. Little brother's shirt instantly sticks to his skin in recompense. Rainwater bounces onto his face. Someone's opened the attic window, despite the fact that father is always so adamant about keeping it locked at all times. The baseboards groan as they take his weight. A loud bang, like metal hitting wood, rings through the attic. He hears a voice, a harsh whisper in the air. He shivers, cold sweat building behind his neck as he carefully moves around the boxes of Christmas ornaments stacked all the way to the rooftop. Mother, he calls carefully. The flashlight burns over a dozen irrelevant antiques and pieces of junk until fabric comes into view, a soaked flowery pattern, dirty with dust and red stains. The fabric is the tail of a dress, one his mother had been wearing this morning. And as the flashlight travels up, Mrs. Clark slowly comes into view. Her hair is damp and stringy, pasted down to her skin and the silk of her previously flawless dress. Her shoulders shake and he can hear her murmuring to herself, but he can't make out what she's saying. The banging noise sounds again, and it looks as though she's lifting something to her face. Mother? She twitches but doesn't turn to acknowledge him. Fear clogs in his throat as the words continue to spill from her mouth. He takes a step forward, then another, as the downstairs grandfather clock begins to chime the hour. His mother's socked feet are cut up and torn as she sits perched on the heels, on her heels on the baseboard like a flightless bird. At her feet, there's a large piece of meat red, pink, oily, and raw. There's a knife balanced precariously against the beam of wood. His mother's hands are held in front of her face, and her eyes shift as the clock continues to chime, counting the hour. One, two. For a moment, they just stare at each other. Three. A river of red liquid streams from her thumb to her elbow, and she lowers her hands. Her lips are cut up as though she's been chewing on glass. Four. What are you doing up here? She shouts suddenly moving forward. He yelps and loses his foot on the board and his whole body falls through the ceiling leaving him dangling by his arms. Five. Brother can do nothing but watch, mouth agape and turning green as his mother lifts the carving knife into the air, bringing it down on the stake before her. Bang. Six. Her fingers wrap around her cut off morsel, seven. Sun gags. Mother dearest wraps her lips around the raw piece of meat, chewing carefully. She swallows as the living room clock chimes. 8 p.m. Mother is with me now. She babbles to me and plates my hair. 
She's even threaded a pink posy into my hair where I sit admiringly the family portrait again. Josh is on the phone, screaming into the receiver. Don't worry, child, I'll take good care of her. She's not afraid. None of them ever are, especially after they guess my name. There are many names for me, I hear. Delusion, delirium, insanity, lunacy. But my most favorite pet name is probably the simplest. They call me Madness, and this is my little pocket of Wonderland. And you're just in time for tea. And that was Painting the Posies Red by yours truly.